so like Michael, I was, I was listening to the presentations and I was writing down all the things that described me. And as, as owning and being an applied anthropologist, I also am a medical anthropologist, an educational anthropologist, um, an ecological anthropologist, an activist anthropologist, an engaged anthropologist, a public anthropologist, and a practicing anthropologist. And sometimes I just call myself a straight up social anthropologist because it's easier. So I own all of those labels. Yay! Thank you. How did that happen? All right. Oh, interesting. So, um, as an applied anthropologist, the, whether or not to be an applied anthropologist was never too dramatic for me. Um, to give you a little bit of history, I came, I did my PhD at the University of South Florida, which is the oldest applied anthropology program, and it's pretty well respected and theoretically grounded. And before that, I did my master's work at the University of Oxford and in medical anthropology. And the, the, there's something fundamentally applied about medical anthropology that Leslie spoke to earlier. Um, and the, the Brits in general, I think, just seem to be less worried about being applied or not applied, you just kind of do your thing. So, sure, sure. So that's a little bit about my background and how I ended up here, and thank you for having me. I feel like a bit of an outsider coming into this department, is that I recently um, had a, a personal journey where I took a tenure track position um, here in New York City in August, so I'm a fresh um, assistant professor. Yes, that's perfect. Thank you. All right, a fresh assistant professor in anthropology. Um, and I had a little like moment of crisis, like, oh no, like I'm all of these applied public um, anthropologists and now I'm here, I'm gonna be a professor and I'm just gonna be like everybody else and locked in my ivory tower talking about theory. But I did take a, a, an assistant professor position at, at Gutman Community College, which is the newest CUNY school. Um, and it's a very innovative community college. And it actually, like Leslie was saying, it actually allows me to do applied anthropology while being a professor. Um, our first year curriculum um, offers a cl class called Ethnographies of Work, where I engage with um, mostly a lot, of, we have a lot of first um, generation college students and issues of social inclusion and social change and transcending social norms are all part of my everyday practice um, in teaching anthropology and social science. So um, I'm not too worried about it, um, that I'm gonna get locked in my professor box and not be able to be an applied anthropologist anymore. So today what I decided to do, um, and you know, all those labels, if you're interested in any of those things, keep in touch, because I kind of have um, work surrounding all of those different topics. Um, but today I'm gonna talk about my work with two specific NGOs, just because I feel like these are real practical examples of how an applied anthropologist might work. And my work in educational anthropology is actually what led me to both of these research projects. And these weren't educational per se, but it was how people found out about me. And I've done a lot of educational programming and worked with the Ministry of Education in Belize and various places to sort of integrate anthropological research and the benefits into different educational programs. So give you a little history about these two locations that I'm gonna tell you about today. Um, the Guatemala Maya Center is in um, southeast Florida in a little town called Lake Worth. Some of you might know Boca Raton. It seems like that's the, the sixth borough, they say, of, of New York City. Um, it's about 20 minutes north of Boca Raton in South Florida. And it was set up in the 1980s to provide services for um, Guatemala Mayan um, immigrants coming in fleeing the, the Civil War in Guatemala. It was a 30-year Civil War that you might be aware of. Uh, disenfranchised um, a lot of indigenous populations and did a lot of other horrible things that are still, we still are suffering the aftermath from in Guatemala. Um, it was set up by a Catholic priest, Father Frank, and um, was to provide sort of assimilation services in addition to having a small Escualita Maya, they call, which they still have, which was supposed to be like an after school program that allowed Maya children to continue um, learning about their heritage and their Maya ness even in their new location. Now, that Escolita Maya still exists, and Father Frank still wants it to be that, that sort of heritage um, reinvention. And But it's sort of turned into, and he's fighting with school boards, and it's sort of turned into remedial English and math classes. Um, so, that, that's a whole other story that in and of itself. And the other organization, um, which also has a big component 
that serves my communities is in the Toledo district in southern Belize. It's the least populated district with the largest indigenous population. And um, the, the Yashche Conservation Trust is a small NGO, but, um, and it's a local NGO founded by Belizeans with the executive director as a Belizean, but actually attracts lots of different um, environmental scientists of various kinds from the United States and Europe to volunteer and do internships. And it's also staffed. Um, a lot of the, the PhD scientists, they don't have that sort of pool in Belize to draw from, and so they do hire from outside. A lot of their funding comes from big um, international sources, Flora and Fauna International, World Wildlife Fund, and the project that I'm going to tell you about as it relates to them was actually funded by those large sources as well. All right, so two sort of um, similar organizations in that they're sort of grassroots and they also um, serve Maya populations that um, are being disenfranchised, whose connection to the land is very important, but very different in terms of one serving migrants, one is working in communities, and the different sort of focuses, Guatemala Maya Center being more educational and Yashche Conservation Trust being um, having environmental conservation at their center, so where humans enter that. So I'll tell you a little bit about what I did at each and then the results, the actual activist piece or the applied piece. So this is how an applied anthropologist does anthropological research. And I didn't put any theory in this presentation, but I can give you all the theory if you want it because it's very theoretical. All right, so the Guatemala Maya Center, I was called in. They heard I did educational programs in different kind of schools and integrated them. And they said, we have a problem with diabetes and obesity in the community, and we were hoping you can do a nutrition education program. I'm like, okay, that sounds like a good applied anthropological piece, right? And I said, well, before I do a nutrition educational program, has there been any research into what people know about nutrition in the community? Oh, no, they're obese and diabetic, so they, they must not know what they should be eating. And I'm like, well, you know, I'm an anthropologist, so what I'm going to do is maybe talk to people and, and see what they know um, about nutrition so I can see what I need to do to educate them about nutrition. Now, this sounds very basic, right? Something that anthropologists do. We talk to people, and that's pretty foundational. But I found that working with NGOs, this is a piece that oftentimes gets left out, right? So there's an assumption that obese and, and diabetic populations um, are, have a trouble making individual choices about what they're going to eat and don't understand, right? So I, I would suggest to you that anthropologists have a huge role in kind of making that link, but sort of explaining to people that, you know, perhaps it's not just a lack of education that's the problem, and perhaps it's not this individual choice frame, all right? So this is a, all public health, NGOs, you can use this kind of piece of information. So. Um, I did a, a designed an anthropological research study to kind of see what people knew about nutrition. So I participated and observed in the community. I did some semi-structured interviews. I hung out in the center and talked to people waiting for services. Um, we did several focus groups with ladies where we brought ladies in and provided childcare and, and talked with them about nutrition. I did free listing and pile sorting about around nutrition and how people were thinking about it. I also did a structural and environmental analysis, which means I looked at where people were buying food, where they were accessing um, health care, what was available to them, and how they were kind of negotiating those sort of structural issues of, of where they were in the community. And at the end of it all, I did a consensus survey to see if people agreed um, with my findings. Now still, to this day, this research piece um, is remembered in they, nobody really knew what I was doing. Nobody knew what anthropology was, and everybody was very busy like providing everyday services for people. But to this day, people still say that they were so happy that I came and hung out and talked to the, the folks in the waiting room at the Guatemala Maya Center. They're like, you know, you were talking to the ladies, and that was so good that you were talking to the ladies, and you should do that again. Come and talk to the ladies. So we're providing services. <laughs> And this was kind of a revelation, and it was awesome that that was the, but I'm like, yes, you know, it's what anthropologists do, and it's really good to talk to people that you're providing services for. <laughs> All right. So what did I find out? I found out a lots and lots of different things, but this is something interesting that I found out that kind of um, was the crux of me kind of saying, well, maybe an education program 
isn't necessarily our best intervention here. So I, what I was finding is that people were telling me, I was interested in where people were getting certain foods. And so this isn't particularly clear, but there's foods along the bottom and there's three locations indicated by the colors, right? So we have the produce market. Now there's a produce market that actually sells um, very sort of culturally appropriate produce that wasn't that far, about a mile, a mile and a half walk from the Guatemala Maya Center and from the center of Lake Worth where most people, um, most of the Guatemala Maya population were living. Right, and there's the like yerbas and lots of different kinds of things that people might want to eat that are you know healthy and green and, and appropriate. And then there's Publix, which is a like a regular grocery store, and then Walmart, which I'm assuming everybody knows what that is. So um, and we're looking at the different prices, and what I was hearing from the narrative from the ladies is like, well, you know, the produce market is too far because we don't have a vehicle. And it would be nice to go to the produce market, but, it, because it's, but it's too far. Publix is really expensive, but it's very close. And so we can walk there, okay? It's, it's far to walk to the produce market with all the kids and like and carry all the bags of produce back. But sometimes we share a taxi and drive nine miles to Walmart and buy our produce there because it's cheaper. So I actually looked at the prices and found out indeed that Walmart is not cheaper, but their advertising really works. Um, because people were sharing a taxi to go to Walmart to buy produce because it was cheaper. And, you know, at Walmart you don't necessarily, I mean, there is produce there, but you don't necessarily get only the, the healthy foods. Or... All right, so kind of table that for a moment, sort of results, methods, and then I'm going to switch over to Yashche Conservation Trust. So Yashche Conservation Trust contacted me as part of um, a larger grant that they were doing called, this, this study was called Increasing the Understanding of Attitudes, Behaviors, Drivers, and Barriers to slash Opportunities for Behavior Change Toward a More Sustainable Land Use Practices in the Mild Golden Landscape. So this is a very sort of grant type title here. And they said, you know, we have all these programs um, and we're working with farmers and we're trying to get them to adopt these sustainable practices, but our pro our, the farmers seem willing and they're, and they're nice and great and they seem, we had, seem to have a good rapport, but the projects really aren't working very well. Like the, the, the farmers really aren't doing what we want them to do in terms of um, changing their behaviors. And so my hackles got up a little bit when I saw like barriers to behavior change. I'm like, oh, whoa, do we really want to change behavior? Like maybe my anthropological sort of, you know, um, radar was like, I don't know, this is not necessary. Should I be involved in this? But I'm like, you know, if they're inviting a social scientist to the table, they're inviting an anthropologist to come in and work with the community and find out how they can better work with the community, I'm like, that's a good thing. Um, something that I should probably mention at this point and something to kind of think about in the back of your head, my project with the Guatemala Maya Center was completely voluntary. It was a part of my sort of a community service and I was still in grad school at the time. And this project was actually paid. So I was hired as a consultant. Right. So that brings up all those those issues of like, you know, as an anthropologist, our ethical responsibilities are to our communities, regardless of who's paying us or if we're being paid. So um, I made that clear to them, like, OK, you know, I'm going to help you out. I'll do this work. Um, both great people in both NGOs and very willing to kind of hear what I had to say about the anthropology. So what did I do in this case? Um, I held farmers workshops. Now, there, this was a method that they had used before, just when, with working with farmers to hold farmers workshops. So I held farmers workshops and did different sorts of activities where to find out how the farmers were thinking um, about certain things, um, about their land use, why they were doing different things, their different practices. Um, as a as a um, sort of a precursor to this, I had done my field work in this district, my dissertation field work prior to this project. So I did have a sort of a whole range of background knowledge before I started this project about how farmers in this area, Maya farmers, were thinking. Um, and then I had a women's group meeting. We talked to the ladies. That's something that's you know sort of important when you're working with farmers. You don't always talk to the women because it's the men that are farmers. So I thought that was important to understand what's happening in the community. Um, I went to the community visits, informal interviews, and then also free, um, free listing and pile sorts. And in this case, I did pile sorts also, not just with community members, but also with the members of the organization. So I did I threw in a little analysis of how they were thinking about the same sorts of topics in the organization. And they, you know, were skeptical of that, but very, you know, supportive folks. 
who are willing to be analyzed. All right, so this is some of the free listing that was happening in the workshops. I included this because this was a, one of the leaders of the village and she's a, a woman, which is rare, but changing now. So one of the women alcaldes are, are like a village leader. And these are some of the workshops where the men were sort of playing a different a game that I designed to kind of um, for them to put ideas together and see how they were thinking about certain topics related to farming and then the pile sorting. I don't know if you're familiar with that methodology. Um, free listing and pile sorting. It's a comes from cognitive anthropology. Um, it's an it's an interesting <coughs> methodology. Works well with nutrition and kind of categorization. So the free list responses was something pretty interesting. And this kind of, I guess, speaks to this idea of the helpful NGO that's framing my presentation today. And we were asking. Um, What's, what's important to know to do or to farm, and also what, how do you learn how to farm, but in addition to that, how do you know that you are a successful farmer? And this question about success was really interesting to me, because I think a lot of times um, organizations have this sort of idea, a standardized idea of what success is, right? So if you're a successful farmer, you're making a lot of money, right? You're selling crops and you're, you know, your profit is high. And, and I think that most of the volunteers from the United States and Europe come in and they have this idea that, okay, we're going to help people make money, right? You know, and you've heard of this in terms of microloans and things like that. And you'll notice that these are in order of they appeared, and money is number four in terms of the way the farmers were thinking about success in farming. And number one is food for the family. So this was really surprising. So when I presented it to the, to the NGO, to, and... They were like, wow, you know, we are prioritizing helping farmers make money, but they really, growing through their family is number one. And there's a difference, right, if you have a subsistence farmer. So, I mean, we can talk about, you know, the reach of capital and, and these systems, but so this just gives you an idea. And then I wanted to show you these. Now, this is like small, and you probably, if you've never seen um, um, a representation of a pile sort, um, there's, it's a multi multiple dimension scaling analysis. Uh oh um, but it just shows you, it groups how people are thinking about things. And this was the NGO, and up there is the community members. And you can just see how, um, let me see, I'll point out how money um, is very close to sort of food for the family down here and up there with the community members. Um, oh, it's actually close up there as well. But things like helping each other appear towards satisfied and happy. And here, like, money is closer to satisfied and happy. So you look at it in multiple dimensions, and it sees how people are looking at things. But I'll go quickly. All right. So now I'm talking about the interventions, just to wrap up. So what did I do with the research? So, um, all right. Um, <laughs> so I think that, that what people have said about activists, anthropology, um, is actually sort of getting your hands dirty. So that's an, those are applied projects where I'm like looking at an applied problem and, and I throw my research out there and maybe people will use it. And then with the Guatemala My Center, I actually used it. So there was a mall that was broken down and there was all this rubble. And what we did is we um, ended up understanding that the issue wasn't education. That, that the Guatem people at the Guatemala Maya Center knew exactly what they should and shouldn't be eating. They could tell me too much fat, too much salt, sugar, but that they, ha they didn't have the appropriate access to fresh fruits and vegetables because the produce market was too far and the vegetables close were too expensive. And so we, and we did a key keyhole garden project where I had a $10,000 grant and we took the rubble and we built these keyhole gardens. And if you want to know more about that, I can tell you no problem. Um, and so this is, you know, fresh fruits and vegetables at the center and on people's properties. They were growing vegetables. Um, there's some more, getting utensils to grow. And then these, these were my recommendations in my report for Yashche. Now with Yashche, it was a little less direct. I just pre presented the information. Um, these were some of the things I, I told them that they should be doing. And I presented the information and that they had to do with the report with what they will. But they actually have changed the way they approach um, communities in their programs based on the report too. So I was I put it in their hands. I actually didn't do the work, but the work was applied through the, the organization. So it's sort of two different ways that you can work with um, with NGOs. Hopefully, maybe gives you some ideas of how you can apply or what ways that anthropology can be applied and some of the issues that are involved with working with different assumptions that NGOs have. Um, thank you very much for inviting me, and if you want to know more about any of those kinds of roles and how it could play out in New York City, and 
different kinds of ways. Please stay in touch. First um, generation college students and issues of social inclusion and social change and transcending social norms are all part of my everyday practice um, in teaching anthropology and social science. So um, I'm not too worried about it. Um, that I'm going to get locked in my professor box and not be able to be an applied anthropologist anymore. So today what I decided to do, um, and you know all those labels, if you're interested in any of those things, keep in touch because I kind of have um, work surrounding all of those different topics. Um, but today I'm going to talk about my work with two, um, and the, the Brits in general I think just to seem to be less worried about being applied or not applied, you just kind of do your thing. So, Sure, sure. So that's a little bit about my background and how I ended up here, and thank you for having me. I feel like a bit of an outsider coming into this department, is that I recently um, had a, a personal journey where I took a tenure track position um, here in New York City in August, so I'm a fresh um, assistant professor. Yes, that's perfect. Thank you. All right. A fresh assistant professor in anthropology. Um, oh, interesting. So, um, as an applied anthropologist, the, whether or not to be an applied anthropologist was never too dramatic for me. Um, to give you a little bit of history, I came, I did my PhD at the University of South Florida, which is the oldest applied anthropology program, and it's pretty well respected and theoretically grounded. And before that, I did my master's work at the University of Oxford and in medical anthropology. And the, the, there's something fundamentally applied about medical anthropology that Leslie spoke to earlier. And I had a little like moment of crisis, like, oh no, like I'm all of these applied public um, anthropologist, and now I'm here, I'm going to be a professor, and I'm just going to be like everybody else and locked in my ivory tower talking about theory. But I did take a, a, an assistant professor position at, at Gutman Community College, which is the newest CUNY school, um, and it's a very innovative community college. And it actually, like Leslie was saying, it actually allows me to do applied anthropology while being a professor. Um, our first year curriculum um, offers a cl class called Ethnographies of Work, where I engage with um, mostly a lot, we have a lot of, so like Michael, I was, I was listening to the presentations and I was writing down all the things that described me. And as, as owning and being an applied anthropologist, I also am a medical anthropologist, an educational anthropologist, um, an ecological anthropologist, an activist anthropologist, an engaged anthropologist, a public anthropologist, and a practicing anthropologist. And sometimes I just call myself a straight up social anthropologist because it's easier. So I own all of those labels. Yay! Thank you. How did that happen? All right.